All right. That was rough. Okay. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah, I'm here. I'm right. looking at that. No, everything's broken. It's fine. Hey, uh, cool. We are live now. So, all right. Uh, I just posted the link to the other one. And so, um, yeah, sorry about that. So we couldn't get into that channel, and so we're moving to this channel. But uh, I'll periodically check back over here and make sure that people are redirecting here. But since we're live, I guess we could just get started pretty soon. So, hey, everybody, I'm Cody. Um, I work at uh, – I've been doing Bitcoin dev for a while and various Bitcoin projects, not nearly as much as Nifty. Um, Lisa, Lisa runs base 58 and, uh, she's been working as a core lightning core contributor for like a long time and, um, like basically knows everything about Bitcoin and lightning. And so we did a Bitcoin curriculum a little while ago, uh, for Replit and, um, today we're going to go over some fun Bitcoin stuff. So Nifty, you want to do any more introductions while I, so yeah. So Link. Hey everyone, uh, working with Cody for about a year now, and we're excited to walk through the white paper with you guys. Um, I run Base58, like Cody was saying. We do in-person classes in Austin. We've got one coming up in two weeks, so check that out if you want to learn more about how Bitcoin transactions work in person. Um, we'll also have one in March, I mean in April, the last last week of the month. Uh, we're doing a big conference in Austin called Bitcoin++, Plus Plus, so come check it out. But um, without much further ado, I think I'm gonna have to move downstairs because there's a uh, construction. We're gonna Cody set up this awesome replit that we're gonna go through. Um, I think the plan, and Cody, correct me if I'm wrong, is to walk through the white paper that Toshi wrote um, and just see if we can like implement stuff from the white paper. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the idea. And so for anybody who's not not used Bitcoin with Replit before, um, it's super easy because Replit has this Nix backend. Um, you can see my screen, right, Nancy? so yeah it looks yeah. good yeah okay, cool so if we go over here you can go to any REPL and then show the hidden files and if you open up the replit.nix then um over here in this nix configuration it'll just like specify the dependencies and you can just add packages.bitcoin to any REPL that you're using and if you do that it's going to add all of the command line tools and install bitcoin core um, through Nix in your REPL, right? And so then you can do stuff like this where you open a shell and you can start up a Bitcoin node. And so when you do that, um, we'll kind of be walking through the white paper and like some of the, like what's happening behind the scenes for this, but it's gonna look something like this, right? So this is gonna start a node from my REPL, which will connect to a bunch of other nodes and it'll start speaking Bitcoin to these other nodes. And as it's doing that, um, we'll kind of walk through that stuff, right? But just for example, there we go. I just started up this Bitcoin node. And so it goes in, it syncs the block headers, and then it starts uh, checking the history of the blockchain. But let's kind of back over to the tutorial and uh, we can have this running on the side while we do this. So, gotcha. So, um, Bitcoin, a peer to peer electronic cash system, right? So, Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency, right? Well, it's a decentralized currency that Satoshi invented, right? And so, from the abstract over here, I'll just read this one because this one's worth reading in full, and then we'll kind of jump around for as we're doing this, right? So, uh, Bitcoin abstract, a purely peer to peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We've proposed a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. 
the network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. And this is going to be what I think Lisa and I spend the most time on of doing this proof of work stuff, because this I think is what makes Bitcoin the most fun and interesting. And uh, it's like also the most fun to implement. So the longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outspace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will. Accepting the longest proof of work chain is proof of what happened while they were gone. So um, there's a lot there. And if you guys have questions, like feel free to put them in the live chat and I'll occasionally go back and forth with that, right? But um, like for me, the thing that I always take away from what makes Bitcoin special and what makes it cool is that because it's using proof of work and because it's doing this hash chaining thing, it's basically the, what Satoshi like to say is that um, the proof of work speaks for itself. Like there's no way to falsify this stuff. It's not like I have to trust somebody. I, it's that, but if I can get access to the information, I can verify the information for myself. So I don't know, Lisa, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin as kind of abstract concept? For, for yeah, that? totally. I mean, I think this is true. And I think like one thing about this that like, mm, I think it's like still not taught in like a lot of school level things is like this like revolutionized kind of the way that people did distributed computing. This whole this like first paragraph, it seems really simple, but it was like an entire entirely like different. It's a entire break from the way people had been thinking about how to do distributed computing um, before this. It's the fact you can leave and come back and use this concept of something called like proof of work to figure out like what everyone else had decided was is completely new and novel. And it's the first time that like First time that people tried it. And like, frankly, like it's impressive that it like worked, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like that's, that's the thing that I find uh, like so interesting about it too, is that like, this is something that actually works, right? It's something where Satoshi released it. And like, ever since he released it, it's basically been unchanged in terms of like the fundamental structure for it. Like there's been some changes in terms of like SegWit and like we can go over some of that stuff maybe, but like this, he released it out and like, it's been working <laughs> and you can like go back and you can see that it works. And it's not something where it's like every once in a while we have to be like changing it and updating it and all those kinds of things. If you do that, we can go over softworks and that sort of stuff if people are interested, but um, this thing like actually works. It is like a you know very pragmatic solution to this problem. And so you guys might be wondering if you've never seen Bitcoin before, uh, what's happening on the right side of my screen right now. So if we go over here, um, we can start kind of pointing things out and saying like, what do we notice about this stuff? So if we look at each of these messages, these are update tip, right? So this is like the new best is this is the chain tip that heights 2267. Uh, that, so that's block number 2267. What the version number is it? Is it the kind of work on it? From, you see this is from like 2009. Okay. Um, this is from like 2009. And the progress toward where we are right now is that we have like barely gotten anywhere. But that's okay. <laughs> so um, like Bitcoin was launched at like the beginning of 2009. So the white paper comes out end of 2008. 2009 is when like the first... Bitcoin, uh, like Bitcoin client gets released by Satoshi. And in this REPL over here, um, I, I can post the link to it, is I put a couple different versions of Bitcoin. So there's Bitcoin Core as it exists today. That's in the Bitcoin folder. Um, Bitcoin's written in C++ and they're always looking for open source contributors. So if you want to contribute to a fun open source project, Bitcoin is always the coolest. Um, there's Satoshi's version, which this is the alpha release. This was what uh, Satoshi released in 2009. Uh, I think it was like January 3rd, 2009 when he released this. And if you notice, it's like, it's Bitcoin.exe. Like he originally wrote it in C++ as a Windows client. And so one of the first things that some open source contributors did when they came to the project was they um, rewrote it so that you could run it on uh, Linux systems, right? which was pretty cool. And then there's also this kind of like just a piece of Bitcoin history is uh, there's this pre-alpha version. And so when Satoshi was um, developing Bitcoin, he spent like a year and a half on it himself. Uh, like a, this is like according to what he's told people, like nobody really knows who he is. But during that time, he was asking other cryptographers and other people from like it's called the cypherpunk mailing list for their opinions about things. And um, during that, this is when he initially started writing out the code. He wrote main and he wrote node. And so Bitcoin's like a distributed system with nodes that talk to each other. Yeah. And so this is like his first uh, first attempts to run through and like actually uh, start implementing this stuff himself, which is a 
I think pretty cool, right? So you can kind of like go through and see, he's got like a lot of notes inside of here of like his thoughts at the time and like what he's trying to work with and some bugs that he's trying to work on, which is pretty cool. So yeah, so let's, uh, let's go back over here, right? So it's like distributed peer-to-peer -peer electronic cache. Like how does that actually work, right? So we go to the internet um, inter introduction. This kind of just gives some context of that like basically people are using credit cards now and credit cards don't give good privacy. <laughs> so this is why he wants to do it. Um, the thing that he identifies here as like the most important uh, like part here is like making it a distributed system, right? But if we go down here, so what is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Transactions that are completely uh, computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud. Routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. System secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any other cooperating group of attackers. So Nifty, do you want to, as the first one, maybe start explaining what double spending is and see if we can illustrate some of this in Python? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I think so. Like, I think the way that I like to kind of think about like double spending is um, the what do you call it when you've got like so like in money, like physical objects of money, right? If I have a five dollar bill and I go and I like, how do you like double spend a five dollar bill, right? We have to like go and make a copy of it. Well, how do you make a copy of a five dollar bill? You find like a printer, right, and like make a copy and print it out and then take it to the store and give it to someone else, and now you've managed to spend five dollars. Um, but like if someone like making a copy of a $5 bill that someone else will accept as real currency is really difficult, right? So making copies of, um, sorry, there's like construction here. Um, making copies of the stuff that you're trying to do. <laughs> Let me move over as far away as I can from this. Um, it's like, yeah, the construction's noisy. I'm sorry. Um, the, yeah, but it's like the general idea. Okay, so like it's hard. The general idea in physical world double spend problem is that it's really difficult to it's really difficult to make copies of objects that are physical, right? Um, yeah. And but like as soon as you take that like five dollar bills and make it digital, so to speak. So now when you say like okay, I've got like a picture of like a JPEG, for example, like how expensive is it to make a copy of a JPEG on a computer? Um, it's really cheap, right? It's really easy. This is like something that you can do like really really easily, right? Um, uh, yeah. So this has like been like. So the whole idea with like a double spend problem in a digital currency, right? So Satoshi is also talking about like electronic money, right? He's saying all electronic money up until this point in 2009 is like a bunch of big banks that like send each other messages that say, hey, so-and-so has a credit card and they want to spend $100 at Macy's or whatever. Um, so like he's basically, okay, how do we like take this digital money and how do we make a system that like is really hard to like make a copy of it so if i have like a thing that says i own five dollars online how can i prevent it from like someone else saying like oh i have five dollars and i've spent it like at macy's and at like i don't know boba tea whatever right because it's yeah. so easy to make copies of stuff digitally so the way that he came up with how to fix this is like we're gonna write these transactions into a a record of transactions such that there can only be one usage of each like five dollar bill um in the entire like block stream blockchain um in the entire blockchain so yeah so it's like okay how do we build like these like transactions because i like i want to send five dollars to macy's but make it such that the five dollars the digital five dollars that i send to macy's can't i can't also like make a copy of it and resend it somewhere else later and still have that make like a valid thing so yeah so the the kind of like the work that he's trying to accomplish right is how do we make transactions in a way that like every, one transaction will like completely make the money that I used to have and then transact it away to someone else. How do I make it such that I can never like respend that money? So that's the double spend problem. Hopefully that was like not super long explanation. Yeah, no, 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 that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, I think before we try to do some Python stuff for it, let's, you want to just do it on, we can just do it on Red Chest and kind of demonstrate like what this might look like. For, yeah, that sounds good. Cool. So let's try start. You're gonna try and double spend a transaction, Cody? Yeah. <laughs> we can so, double spend a transaction, would you? Um, okay. That's gonna be really hammered. <laughs> if you start Bitcoin running, will it run on the same? I think I'm on the same uh, record as you. Yeah, I think so. You'll be able to hit Bitcoin CLI against the same one. 
Okay. In the same ruffle as me. So Thanks. let's see. So what we're going to do right now. So what I was doing previously was uh, I was just starting Bitcoin on mainnet. And so mainnet is like the real Bitcoin, right? Where it's like the longest proof of work chain that's been worked on since Satoshi originally re released the client. There's a bunch of test nets and stuff that you can play with. And so reg test is for regression testing. It's just a local one to this ruffle that um, I'm going to start up, right? And so when you start it, I want to start, this is me like starting the Bitcoin daemon, so the Bitcoin process on reg test. And I want it to start in the background. So it started as a daemon. And then I have to set a fallback fee uh, for purposes. I think newer versions of Bitcoin Core, I don't think you have to set this anymore, but I could be wrong. Whatever, it's fine. Bug it. I think um, they finally set a default. So... Then you can use uh, the Bitcoin CLI, which is the Bitcoin command line interface for talking to your different uh, like Bitcoin nodes, right? So I'm going to talk to the reg test Bitcoin node that I just started. I'm going to say get blockchain info. Right? So if we look here, so I just started this chain and there's no blocks on it, right? So I'm starting with nothing. There's like nothing over here. I can control instead of doing proof of work, we're going to have like proof of Cody did a command, which is going to be like Bitcoin CLI, fetch test. Uh, uh, one sec. So I need to make a wallet first, right? So that I can receive coins. I promise it's going to start making sense as soon as we start putting these things together. So uh, a wallet faults. Uh, say which one it is. Cool. So now I have a wallet, right? And we can see what coins do I have. I have no coins, probably. Sweet. And then uh, whenever you have questions about Bitcoin TLI, you can just... Pass it, sorry. You can just pass it <laughs> help command and it'll tell you what you should do. So if we go over here, I want to mine and I forgot what the mining command is because I haven't used rush test in a while. You remember what it is, Lisa? It's, uh... uh to mine it, it generate from generate to address. Yeah, generate to address. So for that I have to get an address and we can go over what those are later. But Bitcoin CLI get new address. So this is a Bitcoin address. I'm gonna send the coins to address. So I'm gonna generate a hundred blocks that are gonna pay out to this address and coinbase transactions will uh, go over that later. It's actually mentioned in the white paper, which I thought was interesting. But cool. So now if I do get blockchain info, Bitcoin CLI, uh, get blockchain info. So you can see that there's a hundred blocks, right? That I just generated. And these are the block hashes. We don't have to get into that right now. But so now we have a blockchain of a hundred blocks and every block creates 50 coins. And those 50 coins I've been spending to uh, this address over here. So if I do, that's the one in my wallet, reg test, list unspent. Uh, uh, actually, empty. okay. You need to, yeah, if you can get, get balances uh, instead of list unspent, should be, yeah, yeah you got to see one more to make it spendable. Yeah. You have to make it one more. So once we get to kind of the end of the white paper, you'll kind of see why we have to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so if I go here now. There we go. So this is a Bitcoin, right? Bitcoins it's not just are one like, Bitcoin, 50. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends. So we like overload the term Bitcoin, right? So this is like a coin and this yeah. coin is worth 50. And the unit that we call it is also called Bitcoin. This is like a coin that is worth 50 Bitcoin. Right. right. Yep. This is like why Bitcoin is so confusing sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Well, this yeah. is kind of like, I think maybe if you think of it more as like this like object, this like list and spend object is like the $5 bill. It's like the bill. 
and then the denomination yeah. of it is 50, right? So you can have like the thing in Bitcoin, maybe this is like a decent way to think about it is like there's um, your wallet is full of bills and all of the bills have different denominations. And instead of like, because it's not issued by a central currency, because it's like done by people in a peer to peer way, each of the bills in your wallet can be of like any size, yeah. any amount. Um, yeah. So that's just like, think, yeah, that's just like I think a good way to think about it. Yeah. Um, sorry. He's got a good picture of transactions inside of here. But there we go. Cool. Yeah. So in the white paper, the way that he describes his model that he's going to be using is that transactions have inputs and outputs. And so this is like a single coin over here, right? And so if I do another one like this, okay. uh, and then I do this. But you can see now I have two separate coins, just like Lisa was describing, where these are like $5 bills. bills right? Yeah. These are like both 50, 50 Bitcoin though. bills, right? Yeah. And so these, I can use these as inputs for transactions, which will then have outputs, right? And the way that we're going to stop double spending is that whenever I use this as an input, it's going to be completely consumed. So now this thing is invalid. And then it's going to have outputs that come out of this. And those are the new valid ones, right? So even if I make copies of this one, because it's already been spent, we uh, can't do that. And so an example of that would be if I get a new address. Here, I want to send some Bitcoin to that new address. You just send to oh, okay. You just use send to address. Yeah, awesome. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, we can send raw transaction. Uh, no, send to address. Not send to address will just do it. Yeah. Who's uh, going through and building the whole thing? Uh, send to this address. Is cheating one. Yeah. Uh, ten. That one. Uh, ten goes at the end. Yeah. Put the address first, and then the. The amount you want to send, so like, so like send to address how much amount because of that. Yeah, there you go. So okay, so that's the hash of that one. So then let's get this transaction and kind of break it down and see what just happened here. That's uh, transaction. Cool. Yeah, so if we go over here, so uh, actually let's break down the whole transaction. You wanna do that? That's yeah, it might be easier to do it if, um, I'm not used to this view. If you um, if you run it again, but try putting true at the, run the same command, but add a true at the end, what does that do? Nope. Can you try get raw transaction instead of get transaction? I'm just like, there's like a certain format of JSON that I'm used to yeah. seeing that like get raw transaction. Will this work? Do we set up? It should work. I don't know. It just needs the. Yeah, if you're gonna do that. You can just do decode raw transaction instead of get. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Go. Yeah. Let's this over. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Uh, so we're spending one of the bills from our wallet and we're making two new bills, basically. Ah. Sorry, new file. Cool. So this is the transaction we just made, right? Yes. This was that transaction that I just sent. So if we go over here, I had two coins, this one and this one. Yep. And then I wanted to send 10 to this new guy right here. And this is the hash of this transaction. So if you want to walk through this one of how this works? Yeah, we can walk through it. So there's like, we're going to take one of the bills that was in our wallet, right? One of the $50 bills, and we're going to put it inside a transaction. And say basically we're gonna be like, hey, I'm spending telling everyone, hey, I'm spending this bill, right? That's in my wallet. 
Um, and it's gonna like, it's gonna be spent. We're gonna like, kind of like, everyone can like forget that it exists. We're gonna throw it away because I'm spending it, right? It can't be spent again. And so the way that you do that is like in the little transaction you have, if you look over at like line number nine on the left side pane, right? Um, it says VIN, it's kind of like, I don't know. I'm not gonna explain what that means right now, it's fine. Um, but if you go down to like the, this is like basically a list of bills that you're spending. Um, you'll notice that it's got like a TXID that you're spending and um, it's got some other data in there. But if, I think that TXID, that EA8B thing, if you yeah. go back to the list on spent coding, like this is how you can map, this is how you can like associate what was in your wallet, what bills were in your wallet and what's being spent, right? So that that one matches one of these two, right? Okay, so yeah. that's like- The yeah, second so, one right here. Yeah, exactly. So every bill in your wallet has an, a unique identifier, so to speak. Um, and so when you spend a bill, you have to like uniquely identify it in the new transaction. Like, yo, I'm spending this bill out of my wallet. Um, yeah. And then you have to like provide some proof that you know, um, you have to provide some proof that you know that you have the right to spend that bill because everyone knows about the bills. They're not secret data. So that's where this like, these like blobs of like hex are. This is like the proof that my wallet has the right to spend this um, bill so to speak, kind of like a, I don't know, checks I feel like are like really old school these days, but if you've ever like used a bank check where you like write out what you're spending and then have to sign it, this like data right here is basically like the signing proof that's like, I have the right to spend money at it from this bill kind of thing. Yeah. Cool, okay. So let's see where it went, right? So we had 50, right? We had 50. So if you look in the like on the right, the left, left right side, um, it says we had 50 that we were spending for this bill, right? Amount is 50. Yeah, that one, exactly. So it says amount, I don't, there's no line number, but like midway down, it says amount 50. Okay, so we're spending 50. We put one $50 bill in this transaction. So if you scroll down to like the V out, so this is where we're, basically we're gonna like create new bills, right? We're gonna, we're gonna take that 50 and we're gonna split it into two. We're gonna split it into one of, if you look at the second one in here, the second like new bill we're creating to put in someone's wallet, it's worth 10, right? And then, um the and then we're getting some information in here like the script pub key thing like all that like hex data that's basically like saying who has the right to spend it or what you would need to like spend this bill so you like include it in a transaction another time like as this on the top side and then the one on the top is like 39.9999999947 something um that's basically us because we like the $50 bill we put in we want to send we're only sending 10 of that 50 to our friend. So we wanna send the rest of it back to ourselves, right? So like once you use a bill, like that $50 bill is gone forever, right? So you have to like basically create a new bill that gets sent back to your wallet. Um, and like Bitcoin Core will do this automatically, right? Like we told it to send the 10 and it sent the 10, but it automatically sent like the 39 and some change back to ourselves. So we actually call that like the change output, right? That's the one that like, I had a $50 bill. I needed to send 10 to my friends. So I made a new $10 bill for them. And then I had to send the rest of it as change back to myself as like a new bill, I think. Which is yeah. kind of weird. Like, so bills are like one time use like objects, right? And then once you put it in a transaction, you can't ever spend it again. You can't spend this. Like, so the reason, the fact that you can't spend it again is the reason why you have to like create a new one with your change in it, right? Because otherwise you could just like subtract the value from the existing one. But Bitcoin, once it's spent, it's gone forever. So, yeah, exactly. So, and this is in the white paper. It's a section nine when he talks about this. That this is the transaction model that we were just looking at, right? Of that we had this one. We had one input, which was this coin that we had right here. Yeah. And then we had two outputs, and one output was the payment, which was the ten dollars that we were sending to the other guy, and then. This one was the change output back to ourselves. And you notice that the fee is not here. The fee is implied by the difference between these. Like we can go into how the fee goes to the miner later. But um, I think the more fun one right now and what I've kind of got prep for you is because it's uh, fun watching Nifty try to code these things live. Oh, is, no. <laughs> yeah, is um, the hash chains, right? So let's kind of move away. So this is like how the transactions work, right? And so... Just for everybody who wants to play around with Bitcoin from inside the uh, inside of REPL, 
you just go through those processes. Uh, I'll put links to other tutorials that I've made for how to get started with them. But the basic idea is just you start Bitcoin on whatever network you want to be on. So you can start it on mainnet. The REPL has got some pretty limited storage, though. And so you're not going to be able to store 500 gigabytes worth of blockchain data for that. Um, you can start it on SigNet, which is a signature net, which is like a, just a smaller chain that you can play with that coins aren't worth anything. Um, you can do it on testnet or you can do it on regnet, which is what we've been doing, where we just have this local blockchain that we can control. We don't have to rely on miners to do stuff, right? Because if I want to make new coins, let me just go back and do it. Yeah, so if I want to make new coins, then I can just make them myself right here. But the way I'm doing it is on the blockchain. Right? So we've made a bunch of them. But... Okay, cool. So let's go over here. Let's go back to hash chains. So hash chains. Lisa, how do I know the order of these things? What if I try to spend those same coins like three or four times? What if I make multiple transactions? What if I go? Yeah, right. So like, I mean, in theory, you just made a transaction, right? We were looking at one transaction and we we're saying, oh, this villain's like one of the bills out of your wallet, right? And then no one can ever spend it again. We didn't explain how that happened. Like, you'd be like, yeah, okay, well, what if I just like make a new transaction and send it, you know, like how, who's like enforcing the fact that I've already spent these coins, right? And the answer is we use consensus, um, specifically Nakamoto consensus to make sure that um, everyone is currently at consensus. That means every like Bitcoin node on the network agrees um, what the current state of which coins like have and have not been spent. And this is like literally all that Bitcoin consensus is doing is like seeing or like making sure that everyone has the same view of what Bitcoin coins across everyone's wallets globally have not been spent yet. So as soon as a transaction gets spent, um, and this is like, and this is where like getting a transaction into a block, like, what is that actually good for? Like, why do people say like, oh, a Bitcoin transaction isn't valid until it's in a block? The answer is that um, the answer is that until it's in a block, there's no guarantee that that like trans that bill, like that that coin or bills I've been calling them from your wallet that someone put into a transaction to send to you, they won't create a different transaction with that same bill. Um, until only one of those transactions can get into the blockchain. And so by waiting until the transaction is actually in the blockchain, um, you will, um, that's how you know that you like, you actually like get that money, so to speak. Okay. So the way that this happens is that like the, the, the blocks get like built on top of each other. And so you need to make sure that everyone has like the same view of which transactions have actually happened. So everyone needs to get like the set of transactions that are considered like to have happened on the network in the last 10 minutes at the same time. So in order to, to do this, Bitcoin uses this thing called a block. One way that I like thinking about blocks as they're like, it's kind of like batch processing for transactions, Bitcoin transactions, right? So the um the total number of possible transactions or possible coins that can be spent or whatever um have to in like a certain amount of time on bitcoin have to be able to fit into this batch um and so basically what the miners are doing is they're taking all these like proposed transactions and then they like i don't know they do some proof of work stuff i'm gonna hand wave over that they're like doing some computation things in the background which maybe we'll talk about um and then over a set of transactions and then one of these is kind of like a lottery to see who figures out who gets to make like the next batch of transactions actually add to the chain um once they get found basically they um once that like anyways at one point one miner somewhere is gonna find like what we call the winning black hash I'm, again handing wave over that but like the official thing is that's basically like putting a seal or a stamp on that like batch of transactions so that like every new Bitcoin node, every Bitcoin node on the network is going to get that new batch of transactions. And that little, the hash that the miner computed is what's going to tell them like all of these transactions are good ones to consider as like being spent. So it's almost like you need like a seal of approval to get. So it's like, this is kind of like, I feel like maybe you can kind of think of it and it's, you're not trusting a miner. Like it's all proof of work, like there's math. You can check that the miner did the right work, but 
when you're making a transaction on Bitcoin, you really kind of do need someone to like stamp off on it. And that stamp off on the transaction to make it like a real final transaction is a miner putting it in a block that they do work on top of your transaction, basically. Okay, yeah. did I say it too much? Maybe that's like confusing. No, I think it, and this is a good lead into uh, some of these problems that I've got prepped for you. <laughs> so, well. Yeah, so um, this is this is where I kind of wanted to go for us, right? Because like the, the innovation here with Bitcoin is like the solution to the double spending problem. The way that he solves it is by doing these hash chains with blocks, right? And so yeah. we can kind of explain a little bit about hash chains for these. But um, the stuff that we're going to code through real fast and uh, if and then after this, we can go to Merkle proofs, which are super fun. Right. But the stuff we're going to code through real fast. So let's just take this and move it into main real fast. Yeah. So great. So so you were talking about ordering. Right. So there's a bunch yeah. of like batches. Right. And you need the batches to be in an order. So you have a bunch of transactions that happen. If the transactions aren't ordered, though, that like doesn't help you with a double spend problem, right? Because you don't know like which coins got embedded before which. So how do you take these like series of batches and make it such that one has to come after the other, right? Like how yep. do you prove like a like you know batches happen one at a time? Um, how do you prove like a linearity between batches? Um, and the way that they did that is so cool. It's actually like if you like. This idea from Bitcoin, maybe this is like too much info, but this idea from Bitcoin actually comes from one of this, the footnotes in the Bitcoin white paper. It's actually mm -hmm. one of my favorite. I think I, I haven't read all of the like papers in it, but this was like my favorite one of all the ones I did read. Um, it talks about this thing called time chain. So basically Bitcoin like took this concept from another paper that was like came out with in the 90s um, about time chains. And the whole idea is like, how do you prove that the data that you've got now is built on data you knew about like 10 minutes ago, right? So how do you like order the like um, order data in such a way that like, um, if you know that like order, or order batches, I say, I should say of transactions. So, you know, if you're looking at like batch, like number 10, you know, for a fact that no matter what happened, batch nine definitely had to like be known and made before batch 10 could be made, right? So how do you like order these batches is kind of the question we're trying to solve. Um, Cody, do you want to explain or like I can explain? Yeah, well, let, let's just start writing code for it, right? To kind of Great. walk through it because like, you know, we've got hash lib, right? So <laughs> we got hash lib. Uh, that's all you need, yeah. right? All this you need to replay uh, Bitcoin uh, core yeah. is so a hash lib. Let's kind of go through, and this is like why hashes solve this problem. Right, so move this stuff out of here. Right, so we're gonna use something. We use cryptographic hashes. Right, so basically the idea behind a cryptographic hash, if you guys have never heard of these before, is that for um, you just want something. It's kind of like a blender, right? So it's like I take like an orange, an apple, and a banana, and I drop it in the blender, and then I get a smoothie out. Right, and like you can't unblend the smoothie. It's like once I have the smoothie, you can't go backwards. So just showing you what the smoothie is. I can't, sh uh, I can't tell you, uh, you can't like from the smoothie know what the fruit were, right? But if right. I tell you the fruit, you put them in the blender, it goes through, then you see the smoothie, right? You get and the so same smoothie out every time, right? You follow the same recipe. Yeah. So um, if we do yeah. this one, right? So I'll do like import. Yeah. I just want to do this in the REPL. So uh, let's do, um, I don't know, like bytes of Cody is demoing cryptographic. Right, so this is going to be our input. Notice that, that little b at the front is very important in Python for this to work correctly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's saying like the bytes, the byte encoding of this. Yeah, string. of this string, ASCII string. So let's do hashlib dot sha two fifty six. Of this is going to be like our blender, right? This is the hash function that we're using. Is of that input. Will it blend? Will it blend? Um. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what is it? It's a. It's. Do you want hex digest or do you yeah. want digest? Do you it's want like the? Uh, yeah. Boom. Cool. All right. So basically, you can take any input, encode it as bytes, drop it in the blender, and it'll do a unique output like this, right? And so if I modify, oh, let's do a different input. So if I modify this and use something else. Right. Why don't you uh, make it almost the same except like off by one letter, maybe? Yeah. Cody is MOing. <laughs> That's a B instead of a D. Right. 
uh, cryptographic hashes. Um, do, and do the same thing on the different input. All right, so wait, before we, oh, okay. So how different do we think the output's going to be, right? Is it going to be one letter off in the output? Is it going to be yeah. 10 letters off in the output? Um, looks like it is like every letter is different, right? Yeah. So it's completely random, right? And so basically, if you don't know what this one is exactly, it's not like an optimization problem where you get closer and closer as you're trying to find it. Is every guess is as good as every random guess. And there is no way that I can try to find this except by doing just trying random things, right? And so the search you know, space is really a, big. Yeah, I would start with A, right? <laughs> I would do. Uh, that and I'm like, oh, I didn't find it. Okay, now I'll do B. It's a mystery smoothie, right? Like if someone gives yeah. you a hash and they're like, man, this hash is like really tasty for a smoothie. Like what's your secret ingredient that you put in it? Like, you know, they like have no idea. You're like, I don't know why this is so good. Like it's really good, yep. but I don't and know why. So if I take yeah. if I take the outputs of these hashes and use them for different hash, like as inputs to new hashes, yeah. right? So I say, like, the output, yeah, the output of this one becomes the input to my next one, right? So I'll do like, I don't know, four I in range three. Uh, like a, Are you just going to hash maybe I? Hash lib dot uh, uh, 256 uh, into bytes, right? It's a just i dot bytes or two bytes uh yeah i think that'll work i to bytes except you're gonna make it one byte and it's gonna need to be big so that's okay we'll try that i don't think that's uh, gonna uh work. no because i have to feed i back into itself sorry i can't use a for loop here uh so let's do like i equals uh let's do this bytes of hello and then we do to hmm, counter equals five, right? And then we do, uh, I don't know, well, counter greater than zero. This is not clean, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, let's do. Um, so the general idea is we're gonna, we're gonna start with this initial thing, byte thing of hello, right? And then we're gonna, we're gonna take the hash, the, we're gonna take hello one time, we're gonna hash it. That's gonna give us a result. And then we're gonna take the result of the hash of hello, and we're gonna maybe add some new data to it, but pass it back into the hash function, and we're gonna get a completely new like hash output, right? So this is kind of like chaining hashes together. So as like, like as this while loop that uh, Cody has made um, goes, counts downward, so to speak, we're gonna um, we're gonna keep, we're gonna make like one hash for every round. But the the key point here is that each hash round that you make is going to um, contain inside of it as an input to the hash function. So that means like you needed to know it before you ran the hash function. Um, the result of the hash from the previous round. So basically, if you wanted to like recreate the final hash that we're going to get out of this, um, you would need to have known or you would need to know the original input data um, and then all of the incremental data that maybe we added along the way at each of those um, at each of those hash rounds in order to like recalculate the exact thing. Um, what's really cool about this is that like, I mean, it, I think, it, I mean, I don't know about you, but I always think this like sound, like first time I heard about this, it sounds really complicated. Like, what do you mean you're chaining hashes together? That sounds difficult. But the key thing to think about is like a hash function requires you to know some data that you put into it, right? Um, so as long as you know what the inputs to the hash function are, you can always, you will always, always, always get the same result. This is called being deterministic. If you put the exact same information in, you will get the exact same result out every time. So it's repeatable. Um, so what's cool is that I can like give you kind of all the parts to like the hash function that I've like created or to the hash that result that I've gotten. 
Um, and in our case, it's going to be, okay, take the word hello as bytes, so the B hello, um, and then hash it five times. And when you get to the end, like that result is going to be, you know, whatever hash you get. And if you wanted to recreate that hash, you could verify it. All you would need to know is like, here's the hello data and then the instructions of how many times to hash it, like five times, right? Um, is that useful, Cody? Or like... Yes, that is very useful. Thank you. Uh, oh, you're writing a function. Okay, cool. I, yeah. I was like following along with it. Okay. So, what, where are you writing that thing? I'm just going to like try and find it. Oh, you're in my main. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I'm just in main. So, let's see if this one works. Okay, um, cool. Okay. Do you so, want to take two seconds to talk about how cool Replit multiplayer is? So like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're like streaming, like, yeah. So it's really cool. So the reason I was like, I don't know where Cody is. It's well, I mean, I, I found him really fast because multiplayer is really dope. It's got like, um, it's got the ability to see where your other people is. But basically like, I'm I'm looking at this a Replit on my laptop on, an, um, I just have it open. And Cody and I are basically like sharing a Replit. So I can see everything that he types. He can see everything that I type. Um, it's a really great way to like pair with someone like wherever they are in the world. So that's like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So here, this, so this is like how we're going to start hash chaining, right? So if you can see here is that I'm going to be printing, this is like the counter. So this is like where I'm starting at. And then this is like the hex. This is a hex encoding. I guess really loud. <laughs> is it, I can like turn my thing off. I know. I'm sorry. It's yeah, like, here, let me mute myself. Uh, so these are the bytes at this point, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a hash of those bytes and set that to I, right? So the hash of hello is this thing. The hash of the hash of hello is this thing, right? And so this is like the point of hash chaining, right? Is that the only way that I could have arrived at this number is if I knew what the input was and the input was this thing. And the only way I could have arrived at that number is if I knew what the input was over here. And the only way I could have known what that number was was if I knew what the input was over here. And so when you have these long chains of hashes, whatever the most recent hash is must have occurred after the earlier hashes, right? So let's say that in here or whatever, I want to like, instead of this being hello, this is like, Cody pays Lisa 10 bucks ever, right? So when I get this, everybody agrees that like at this point, at this point in the chain, at this point of the blockchain, that this is what the hash is. So let's say I try to go back and I try to say, hey, actually, or Lisa tries to go back and says like, hey, Cody stole another $5. He tries to change this transaction so that it's Cody pays Lisa 15 bucks, right? Well, now I changed this input, which changed the hash, which changed the hash, which changed the hash, which changed the hash, right? And so this is just, uh, you know, it takes like, you know, half a second or whatever when we're doing this. But what if we added like a difficulty to this? What if we said not just any hash or whatever, but in order for this thing to be valid, it has to have like a certain number of zeros at the beginning. Yep. So let's kind of start that, right? So um, how should uh, how should we do this? Let's do this one. Okay. So uh, let's set difficulty. Difficulty is, let's call it five, right? And so I'm only going to accept as a valid hash something over here if it's got a certain number of zeros or whatever, right? And so you can go over here and let's just, as an arbitrary rule, anything after the period, you can do whatever you want with. Okay, mm -hmm. so over here, in order for this to be like a valid thing, in order for this to be a valid next block or whatever, the hash is going to have to be below that zero, 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 or whatever, right? Um, actually, we don't have to change too much when we're doing this, right? It's just over here. It's just, okay. Right. And so one way to think about this that I find useful is like, so I think there's two things here that are like kind of useful. The first thing is those big hash, those big hash values that we're getting, like every time you're in hash lib and then print it out, it gives you this long garbledygook string of hex, right? That's actually a number. You can take that and you can like convert it to like an actual like number, or maybe it's like, maybe it's a better way to think of it as like bits, right? 
to like how many of the first bits at the beginning of this like long string are zeros, right? Maybe that's a good way to say it. I think that works. Um, and so like, basically, like if you think about like, so a hash function as Cody was pointing out earlier, and this is cryptographic hash functions, like a, a hash function, it has to basically be cryptographic for this to be true about it. I think I'm gonna hand wave over that, oh. it's like slightly true. Um, there's a couple properties of cryptographic hash functions. This is one of them, I think. Um, and that's it, like the, given any random input, the output that you get should be evenly distributed across the entire range of like possible output values, right? So like, what's that saying? Okay, so like, let's say that I was using a hash function they put out like eight bytes of data, for example. Um, what is eight? Uh, let's say eight bits. Let's say that it's a hash function that like hashes things to eight bits, which is like one byte. That means that there's like how many, how many different like combinations of eight bits are there? There's like 256, right? Because that's two to the eight. Um, so that means that if I run, if I put anything into this like magic hash function that I've come up with that um, magic hash function that I've come up with and um, I put 256 things in there, I would assume that like every time I, I hit it, I would get like my chance of getting one, any, any one of the numbers from one to two, from zero to 255 starts at zero would be equal no matter what I put in there, right? So every time you, it's like running a hash function is kind of like rolling the dice, right? Except the size of the dice is like for these, like, what is it? 256 is 256 bits. There's like 256 bits that you're like rolling the dice on, so to speak. Um, so each of those is going to be like at a different value, but it should be randomly done for each of the 256 bits. So you're basically like doing like a, 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 um, a dice roll with like 256, one value, like two value dice, either zero or one. Um, and you do that every single time that you like calculate mm. a new hash, um, except that like if you put the same input in, you'll get the exact same dice roll out, so to speak. Um, why am I saying this? Okay, what? Why does this matter? So whenever you say okay, like out of there's 256 bits, um, when you roll all 256 like two value dice, like it's either gonna come up zero or one. Um, there's like the certain the eight bits at the front, let's say, have to be zero, right? So then you can start using like probability or math to figure out how many times am I going to have to roll um, the dice on average before I'm going to find like a roll of all those dice where the first eight in a row are zero, right? So that becomes like a probability game, right? Um, I don't know how to calculate it. What's like eight out of 256? Uh, eight out of 256 is... 0.03. <laughs> 0.03. So I don't know. Wait, what does this mean? I need I need to get eight roll. I'm so bad at probability, but this is like really important for understanding exactly like being able to calculate. But like I guess the question is like if I need eight zeros in a row, how many times am I gonna have to roll the dice before like let's just imagine I just had eight, because I think eight dice is basically the same, right? Is like eight the first eight out of two hundred and fifty six. I think you'd have to how many times do I have to roll two eight dice? before I would expect all eight of them to be zero if the only two values you can have are zero or one. I think it's a lot. I think it's two. I think it's like, I think you you need like eight. So you need like half the time on the first one, 50% of the time on the second one. So I think it's yeah. like 0. 0.5 to the eighth or whatever is like what that ends up being. So one yeah. over 256, which is, yeah, 0. 0.0039 is what I get. So basically you would need, you would expect to need to roll um, almost a thousand times, you get three out of every thousand rolls, you would get, um, you would expect the first eight bits to be zero, right? I think that's right. Um, yep. So basically that means you need to like, um, oh, you just stopped sharing your screen, Cody. I don't know if you did yeah, that. Sorry, I'm fixing it real fast. No, that's cool. Um, yeah, but like, yeah. So like, this is like, okay, so this is kind of where the, um, yeah, eight out of 256. It's actually like, it's going to be, um, it's actually going to be, I was wrong. It's, um, it's one half, it's going to be one half um, to the eighth, right? Because I need eight at the front. So, like, if you think about it, each of the, so, like, just, like, eight dice, right? And each of the dice, again, only has two sides. I know I keep saying that. I guess it's, like, coin flips, but I like thinking of them dice. Whatever. It's fine. Um, but each of them can only be zero or one, right? So, there's a 50-50 chance on each one that you'll get zero. And there's a 50-50 chance eight times. So, you, like, do that to half times itself eight times, which is raising it to the power. Um, so that's this much. This is how often you would expect to get eight zeros in a row. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But then, like, Bitcoin makes it a lot. Like, I don't actually know how many we're up to right now. But I guess if it's, like, I don't know, let's guess it's, like, 56. Well, um, well that's what that's what we want to, I want to jump into, Lisa. So that's why I kind of moved over this because uh, we're kind of running low on time. But, but I want to get through this stuff. So this one, what we're going to be doing here is yeah. getting Bitcoin block header data from Explora and verifying the integrity of its hashes. Hell yes. That's so cool. This is like a fun one, right? And so this is exactly what Lisa's talking about. And so we're going to see when we go through this of like what it is. So Lisa, do you want to take this first one? Uh, yeah, let's go. Um, okay. Look at all the so, zeros on that ID though. That's what we're talking about. I got all the zeros at the front, right? Um, yeah. So this is actually super low, right? So this is blocks 100 to 91, right? That this one was. This was my Yeah. Idea. But what's, so what's cool about these zeros, though, is every two zeros represents those eight bits we were talking about, which was this number that's like the one half over eight thing, right? So there's a, this many, you had to roll on expectation, like over almost a thousand times to get every two pairs of zeros on this. So this is like a lot of rolls of the dice is basically is all I'm saying um, yeah. to get like find this number. Um, okay, cool. So basically the way this works is like, how does a block header, a block header is a... Um, it's like a set of data. It's got like a ID, which is the hash of all the data inside of it. Um, it's got a height, which is like not included. That's sort of like some extra data you can calculate if you've been counting blocks. Um, but the version it's going to contain, it's going to contain a timestamp. It's going to take a can transaction count, maybe. Yeah, it should have a transaction count. It's not going to have a size and weight, I think. Um, it's going to include a Merkle root, and it's going to include the previous block hash, and definitely has a nonce. And maybe the difficulty bits. I'm not sure. Okay. What? Okay. Here yeah, we go. It well, it has the, yeah, it has bits. You know. So all that's going to go into this. So like what we're doing is we're building a hash. Like we're building the data, I should say. This is like the apple, the orange, and like the, I don't know, the special coconut flavoring we're going to add into our smoothie, right? So what are the parts we're putting in our smoothie? Um, it's going to be the version, the hash, the Merkle root, um, the time, the bits value and the nonce. And then you can see how we're going to like, just how we set it. We're going to add these all together. It's like apple, orange, coconut to the pre-image. And then once we have the pre-image, we're going to just go ahead and start filling some stuff in here. Oh no. Um, why is this broken? It's fine. Um, we're going to do the SHA-256 of the pre-image. Um, oh, hey, you're all the way down here. Uh, no, I was starting at the top. Oh, starting at the top. Yo, okay. Yeah, so this is the so this is the first one. So let's uh oh. yeah, so up here. So this is we're gonna get ten Bitcoin blocks from Blockstream. Mm -hmm. So if you guys wanna use Esplora, it's like an API that um, Blockstream maintains for getting Bitcoin data. So this is like the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Like the main chain Bitcoin blockchain. This is like there's currently seven hundred and seventy eight thousand eight hundred and twenty six blocks. And if you want to get data about it, then you can use the Esplora API, which is what they maintain over here. So that's what we're going to do in this REPL, is that we're going to use blockstream.info, which is Esplora, the API. And I want to say, hey, get blocks starting at this block height, right? And so if I just go down here, and then up for a second, I'm going to run it. it. should work. Uh, that's because I, really in. I got you. I think you're good yeah. now. Bad. Uh, invalid URL. Invalid URL. No scheme is applied. You gotta put the HTTPS at the front. Yeah. No schema. Uh, because I need to turn this into text. Cool. Dope. Well, that's a lot of data. Oh my yeah. God. All right. <laughs> that's a lot of data. So we entered we the can... matrix. What's going on here? No. Okay. okay. Um, so we can work on formatting this, right? But it's getting the data at least now, right? Yeah, that's definitely getting some data. I don't know. Because I I think I'm double dumping it because I don't need to do that. Is that mm -hmm. I just need to print block. There's like a lot of data. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe next time we just pull a per piece out of the block headers. I don't think you're getting like the block header. You're getting like a whole block. Ah. That's like that's like all the data. That's like all the transactions in a hundred blocks. That's like two hundred megabytes oh. of data. Right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I hit the wrong endpoint. Is uh, <laughs> go over here, Explora API. I want to get blocks. 
Let me just make sure I got this right. Is get block about a block. Uh, I want to get the last 10 blocks. You want to get block headers, right? I don't actually know. Where are you looking to look at the API yeah. thing? Mempool. Oh, the um, mempool that's based. Okay. Block. Blocks. That's what I have to do. <laughs> is. Adapting on the fly. Where's console? Dex invalid hex string. Sorry, let me just see what I'm getting when I return this. Invalid hex string. Where are we? That's on line 26. Line, assert line equal. There's nothing in line, I think. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. Can we just comment this stuff out and then? Fancy. We've 10 blocks. Valid hex string. Why is it throwing that? Uh, probably the print is printing out the text that it gets from the thing. Yes. So. Four hundred. Oh. Four hundred is not a valid uh. Yes, that's right. Right. Oh, maybe the um the block height thing that you're passing in was invalid hex string. So what we're reading was the error message the API was sending us. So that's oh, so we're using an f string here. That's two hundred is correct. Yeah, two hundred is yeah. right. So now you should be able to get the text out. <laughs> so if you do like dot text now, it should work. Yeah. Okay. This is gonna give you um a bunch of data again. Oh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> Just hey, here's... Yeah, that's what I wanted. All right. Cool. So. Yeah, here we go. So it's giving me those blocks. Oh, I don't know why I was doing that last time. <laughs> That's okay. So let's go over here. Dreamy noisy here. I'm going to mute myself for a little bit. Okay. That's all good. So if I go over here, I'm trying to get block headers. Let's go to JSON. Dumps. Uh, it's doing it as a list. Um, because it's doing it as a list right there, I want to unbundle that list. If that it's text right there. So I think I have to load that in a JSON, sorry. Is that uh, box equals JSON. Call this one blocks. Turn on the fly, which is fun. Hmm. All right. Well, it's printing it as a list, which I don't want. I want to print it as separated out. Oh, dumps. Hmm. I don't know. Why is it not doing that? Oh, there we go. Okay, because I'm double printing them. <laughs> All right. Sweet. There we go. So here we go. This gives me the last 10 blocks. Okay. That was an adventure, but that's okay. So this gives me the last 10 blocks, right? So I want the block, this is the blocks from height 100 all the way back to 91, 
right? And so each one of these, as you can see, has like the, you know, it's got the ID, it's got the height, it's got the version, timestamp, transaction count, like all those stuff, right? So if we go over here, this block 100 over here, I think it matches, right? Yeah, so this is the same one. So, this, so let's go uncomment these tests. And this one should pass. So if I do that, cert len. Yeah, so here I'm just testing to see if this works, right? So it's like, I want to get the 10 previous blocks from whatever I pass in over here. And I know that block 100 looks like this, right? So I'm going to be comparing to see whether or not block 100 matches the one that I have over here, which it should. Uh, that object of type none type has no len. Because I'm not doing this right. Because I'm not returning here. There we go. Okay. So that should work now. Okay, cert. Yes, it does. Which means it'll pass this. Yes. Okay. All right. So brief detour, but we figured it out. So over here, this is get 10 previous blocks. And so it's getting the 10 previous blocks. And so it's just not pretty printing them right now. Right. Um, this is testing to see that the block 100 matches. So then let's go over here. Now we're going to verify that these blocks match what they're supposed to. So every block should the, uh, if we go over here and look at this one, there should be a Prev hash inside of here. Previous block hash, right? So this is the previous block hash that's embedded in 100. And so this previous block hash should match 99's hash, right? And so those are the functions that we're going to run right now, which is good. Sorry, that took a little while. Need to debug that live. Jeez. So helper functions over here. We're going to do SHA-256D. So go return. Uh, let's say the data that we're going to be passing in is a, uh, yeah, let's have it be bytes. So uh, return hashlib 56. 56. Data. So the reason why is because uh, Bitcoin block headers are hashed twice instead of once. It's just like a thing that Satoshi did. The reason why you want to do that is uh, the reason why he thought he was doing it was because to prevent something called a length extension attack. But that actually doesn't apply here because it's a, uh, oh, you just imported SHA-256. Uh, you imported SHA-256. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so flip endianness. This is another thing is that you have to flip the byte order. And the reason why is because the computer that uh, Satoshi was using when he did this was, um, it was an Intel chip. And so when you're using an Intel processor, um, the bytes that are encoded in when you're compiling with this stuff or whatever is in, uh, instead of reading it like just normal left to right, whatever, you actually read it two at a time backwards, right? And so you'd read this one as like 9519, 4B8567, right? And so you have to have these flip endianness functions that does this. So let's assume that we're passing in bytes here. And so if we're passing in bytes, use less comprehension to flip those. Okay, format block header. Uh, 
uh, we have to format this. So when we get these back, we have to take the we have to take all of the inputs that we need for these ones, and then like concatenate them together, and then hash that thing. Right, and so that's actually kind of complicated, but uh, so we might not get to that right now. I've got the answers for that, so we could do that later. So then over here, verify Bitcoin block takes two sequential block headers, block and previous block, verifies that block builds on the first block. Return true if the previous block hash field in block matches the SHA-256D output of the previous block. So if we go over here, this will do it. Right. So, yeah. So this one, previous hash would be equal to when we pass in. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so write a function uh, I forgot how I did this so I concatenate all the fields together in exactly this order oh there we go that's how I have the instructions right here so so this one works then find the shot 250 output as hex digest and verify Oh, I like wrote most of this already. Do we need to flip the Indianness on the Merkle root, or is it fine? Um, I don't think we do. We can test it, but <laughs> yeah, then find the shot two fifty six alpha s x digest. So. Previous hash equals block. Okay. Image. I think we're gonna have to convert these to bytes before we pass them in. That's okay. Are they not already? Okay. Uh, these are gonna need to be bytes before we flip them. Yeah. Or you can, in flip endiness, you can convert it to bytes. That might be. Sure. But, uh, let me find the show. Uh, fix me. Okay. If lock. Wait, this isn't right. This is data is already as an int, so I just need to convert the int to a bytes and then, oh, hang on. Yes. Wait a second. Um, this is, it's not from hex, it's int to byte. Yes. To byte, to bytes. Did that, that work? I thought you should be like eight and like, we just do this instead of flipping the Indian I don't know. Be lazy. I don't need that. I do need that. No, it's not eight bytes. It's only four bytes. JK. Yes. Um, so I'm guessing version, time, bits, and nots are all going to be the exact same. Probably. Why does this not work? I think too. It's fine. Um, um, here, let me just over here. Do we call from a block header anymore? No, we don't. That's fine. So we actually don't need this one. What is it? Median time. Not block header. Okay. Yeah, I kind of forgot how I did this for a second. <laughs> so over here, let's 
Let's write it here. Um, I think that works. Um, so the big question is, as previous black ash and the Merkle root flipped or not? I don't think they are. Oh, actually, I need to convert these to bytes. These need to be. Yeah. That's for real. Yeah. So all these ones are bytes, and you can catenate them all together. And then you take the shots 56 of the pre-image. And then you do that. Yeah. Okay. That works. This is going to return a digest, though. So I think you're just going to want hacks here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. And so for this, we we actually don't need format block header at all. Right? Well, I think we did format block header right here. This is actually, we could just like pull this if we wanted yeah. to. This would be the format block header part. Maybe we should do that. I'm just going to pull it out okay. here. I think, and put it here. Um, I don't know what block is, though. And this is the wrong thing, Han. Yeah, so this is this gets to, so block and previous block are going to be that it gets the this block and this block, right? And then it passes in, like, block 100 and block uh, 99. And then it's verifying that block 99, when you get those fields off and hash them, equals blocks there we go yeah um and then the, the pre-image is going to be equal to why are my pre-image is going to be equal to the format block header of the pre-block right yep yeah that should work yes maybe we'll see yes <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Let's uh let's give that a try. So we go over here and get rid of the prints. Well, no, like yeah, I'm not sure about this pre patch thing. That's fine. Um, that should probably work. Uh, we can do that yet. We still got like a couple minutes. So assert blocks. Okay, so there we go. That's why these ones are not matching right now. So yeah, I'm just gonna add a print here. Yeah, let's print right there. Oh, wait, is it doing what I think it's doing? Yeah, OK, that's cool. It's black ash. We could, we could, I could be lazy and just try one thing and see if that fixes it. We can just try reversing these. Uh, which one? Oh, yeah, no, we didn't call flip ending this for those. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah, so this is, uh, we're getting to it. Will that work now? Does it work now? Did I just fix it? Maybe I fix it. Uh, assertion error. Okay, we're slightly off, right? And so this is kind of getting back to like the hashing, right? Of that, <laughs> we know that to find this takes a lot of work, right? But to find this hash over here does not take any work, right? This is like, basically just looks like a random hash, right? And so this is the Wait, correct hash. And so we know that if we get everything in order and we get everything right, then the, these two hashes are gonna match, right? And you can't falsify that. OK. Oh, wait. Hey, that was actually really close. You just have to flip the ending in this on the back of it. Please. On return? Yeah. On the uh, return, you just have to flip the ending in this. Where's the return? Uh, oh, here. Yeah, the output. We should probably do that before we return it, just because, right? Um, Those are the same. No, they're not. They're, they're they're very close. Why why are those like really close except not? Wait, they're they're double flipped. Is oh because I did it as the hex. That's why. Uh, is this okay? There we go. Uh, I think you got some stuff there. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Is that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So that, uh, all right. So we went through stuff really fast there, right? But this is actually pretty cool what we just did. So the stuff on the left-hand side over here, this is like the, um, this is like the, the block hash, right? Because this is the, for each block, well, let's just add prints for this right? so that it, we can actually see if it's doing the same there. So where's the prints that we're doing? Doing this one, we'll call this like block uh, 
block data. So we'll call it block data, whatever. That'll work. Oh, okay. Calculated. kind of unwell, but that's okay. So if we yeah, just run this real fast, it should work. Right? Yeah, okay. So if we look at this, so what we kind of just walked through here is that this is us calculating the block hash. And this is like, this is block 100. And this is the hash. Uh, so this is in block 100. It says, hey, I'm building off a previous block which when hashed produces this number. And this one over here is block 99's hash. So we can say like this block builds off of the block that hashes to this thing. In block 99, it says, hey, I'm building off a block that is built off of this one. And so we say, okay, well, block 98, when I hash it, it goes like that. So let's uh, I should clean this up a little bit just to make it so it's easier to see. So. Block, uh, let's go over here. So we can print in this one, right? So we can do like print uh, block height. This will be like block A. We go for block height there prev hash uh no it's okay you don't have to do this kind of makes a point that's fine but so yeah for like each block it's like hey i'm built off a block that when hashed produces this number this is the previous block that when hash produces that number it has a previous hash in it that says, when I'm hashed, I produce this number. Its previous block, when hashed, produces that same number. Because they match, we can say, like, this one builds on this one, 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 right? Which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, yeah. There's, like, a lot of stuff that I thought we were going to get to that we didn't get to. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's a pretty normal day in the life of a developer. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, it sounds like then we've got more to do in next week, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll plan another one. Um, yeah, but just sort so of this, I'll share the, uh, um, I'll share the REPL that I'm doing this in. So I've got some other stuff in here, right? So I've got like this proof of work blockchain that I built, which is like, it makes a blockchain and it makes a block and it's got miners and like, you know, they like mine and try to like find a block, which is pretty fun. That's fine. Um, and then I've got this, SPV Merkle proof that I wrote yesterday, which I was really proud of this one, is that, so if we take, let me just copy this over so we don't lose this. But, um, we go over here, uh, in the white paper, it covers something called Merkle proofs and how you can use them in order to, um, in order to verify integrity of the block so like this is just the block headers right so if we go back to the tutorial tutorial here right so the hash chain is done on the headers right so you take the blocks metadata and then you take that that's what we just went through and then that gets hashed and that gets input as like the previous hash over here right so where is it it's uh he's got another picture there we go, right? So this is the part that we did right now, where it's like, hey, this block says that it has a previous hash. If I take the hash of this block, it goes into here. Instead of like actually doing all the transactions, you like Merkleize the transactions. You create something called the Merkle tree, and it looks like this, right? So you like line up all the transactions along here. You like hash them all together, and you make a root hash. And this block header thing that we just went up, went through and went through the hashing of. Like that's the thing that gets hashed. So you don't have to do all of these transactions. So the block header is like, where is this? It's 80 bytes, right? But the full block can be like four, uh, can be like four megabytes, right? After segwit. 
right? But so if we go over here, you can basically prove the inclusion of a transaction doing something called a Merkle root. Uh, Merkle root. And I wrote this thing, which you guys can play it's with. It's a proof of inclusion, I think. Oh, that's cool. Proof yeah. of inclusion, I feel like is the... Um... We can go find a transaction. Yeah. Very good. So uh, if we go over here and find like a random transaction. Oh, this is cool. So you can input stuff. Oh, this is nice. So you input so make a nice input transaction ID. And you hit enter. Whoa. And then it gets the Merkle proof. It builds the Merkle tree for that proof. Right? And then it's a, oh, wait, sorry. My Bitcoin D is not running. <laughs> That's okay. And then basically this run, this hits against your Bitcoin node and then says like, uh, actually I can demo that real fast right now. Is that you start the Bitcoin node in the REPL. Bitcoin D dash dash. So uh, we're going to have to get an early transaction in order to do this. Earlier. Okay, never mind. One, two, three, four, five, six. There some transactions. All right, so you get a transaction. This one. And then you pass it in. Oh, what height are we at? Oh, we're really early. Okay, <laughs> well, we I can get anything up to. See, I want to show this because it's super cool. Is that it basically does the proof against your local node? But so all of these transactions just have like one per, which is kind of annoying, right? But I could run it against my local, but I don't want to do that right now. Uh, this is actually going really fast. So let's go. It's gonna take like two minutes in order for this to get up to a point where I could actually do the proof, right? But that's okay. That's uh maybe. Well, what time is it? Could I need to hop off in like five minutes? Just FYI. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'll just get this one, and then, but the Merkle proof for this one is just—it's literally just the transaction. Right? So let's see if this works just with this one. Is that if I go here and hit enter? Uh, block height is out of range. Oh, because you're using reg test, right? I am using reg test. Wait, no, no, because I just started on mainnet. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. So, mm, this... block height is at twenty five hundred. What block height is you are you at? Did you oh. get this out of your Bitcoin core now? This one. Copy paste here. Run it again. Okay, well, <laughs> so there's like no Merkle proof to do, right? Because there's just the one transaction. Right? <laughs> That's okay. Is that it, it works really well for the uh, uh, what's it called? It does it really well for the other ones, but. That's fine. So you guys can play around with that. But. Okay. Hey, thanks, everybody. Sorry about the late start for that one. It's just a YouTube issue. But okay. Thanks, everyone. This was fun. Cool. Do I end broadcast?